Hello, Romans here and welcome to another installment in my Worst to Best series where I take a discography of a certain artist or a band and I rank all of their studio albums going from worst to best based on my own personal opinion. I also review all of the albums from a viewpoint of a musician as I'm a singer, songwriter and a bass player for my own group Yakube. and almost four years ago we released our debut album called Persons in Life. What makes it unique is that it's a heavy prog rock without guitars. Instead you have drums, bass, saxophone and keyboards. You can check out all of our music videos on my YouTube channel. And in the description of all these videos we'll find all the information about where is the record available. It's available on all digital platforms like Spotify, Tidal, Deezer, iTunes, Amazon, Bandcamp, but also in this digipack version of a CD with a very beautifully illustrated 20 pages long booklet. So in case you want one, all you need to do is contact me via an email, on Facebook or on Instagram, or you can get one through Bandcamp as well. And today I'm going to rank all of the studio albums from Ed Guy. Music review. Music review. This video was a long time in the making because it's been more than a year ago that I decided to go through the discography of Ed Guy again and I revisited basically all of their albums and especially the early stuff from Ed Guy. I listened to those albums after like 14 years. Of course, Ed Guy is one of my all time favorite bands. I was listening to them a lot and I mean a lot when I was growing up. So naturally many of those records became very important soundtracks to certain periods of my life. The mastermind behind Ed Guy and the frontman and the lead singer and even bass player on the first two albums is Tobias Summit, who is also the mastermind behind arguably one of the biggest, if not the biggest project in rock and metal, Avantasia. And the guy is just freaking genius. I mean, Tobias Summit is quite possibly one of the best composers and songwriters to ever live in history of music. It's absolutely unprecedented how brilliant the guy is. And um, I really encourage you to follow him on Facebook and or on Instagram where he's got his own Tobias Summit's Avantasia page and people keep asking him a lot of stuff and he occasionally answers to his fans and he also keeps posting a lot of interesting stuff and stories from his life and he's always hinting at wanting to write a book about his life and I think it's gonna be really worth it. Anyway, I try to make these worst to best videos about artists who are no longer active and it's been eight years since the last Ed Guy album, but it's been five years since the last new material because in 2017 they dropped Monuments, which is a basically a compilation of sorts and there were five new songs, but quite honestly, those five new songs were pretty underwhelming and I think some of the weakest songs from Ed Guy, like the first track, not even sure what the name was, but it basically has the same chord progression and almost the same melody as Superheroes. It's just not really that good. I think the final track was, was quite good, but uh, anyway, a lot of people keep asking Toby about a new Ed Guy album and he actually uh, had a post about it and basically said that uh, Ed Guy had run out of steam. I think that that's one reason and the other reason which he also mentioned is that it was just very hard for him to maintain and to direct two huge projects such as Ed Guy and Avantasia. Now, uh, he's been altering between Avantasia and Ed Guy ever since the first Avantasia dropped, but uh, right now he's preparing, he's getting ready the ninth Avantasia album, which should come out sometimes this year. And actually it's been the third Avantasia record he's been working on in a row. My personal guess is that considering Toby is still very, very young, he's like 44 years old, I think that he might have like 20-25 years of career ahead of him. I think we will get two or three Ed Guy albums in the future, but probably not more. I'm pretty sure he's gonna be focused on Avantasia as that's a bigger project. He can probably express himself better there and also I think it earns more money. But the main, the major body of work of Ed Guy is out there and I decided to rank all of their studio albums 
10 studio albums that is and i'm also going to mention a couple of eps and bonus material as well because it's worth talking about okay so let's start with the countdown at number 10 i have kingdom of madness from 1997 this is their well official debut album kind of depends on how you look at it i'm gonna get back to that later in the video but this was their second album but the first one released on a major label and the first one kind of properly recorded in a studio so it's considered to be their debut album and quite honestly this is probably the only album from toby that includes ed guy and avantasia that i would label as a weak and forgettable one and i think toby would agree with me now there are a couple of fans of this album i kind of understand that but this is one that i'm not really planning on returning to so you know they were still very young the production leaves a lot to be desired for this is also the most collaborative album from ed guy because out of the nine songs well if you don't count in dark symphony which is more like an interlude out of the eight songs five were co-written by jens ludwig the guitar player plus one of the songs also has their drummer that they had at the time also as a co-writer it opens up with the track paradise i like the opening lick the guitar i think it sounds pretty cool and it has some moments and some riffs Wings of a Dream is the only song that they sort of kept playing for a while because their first official live disc, Burn Down the Opera, I think from 2003, had only this track from this album as a live song. It's a pretty average power metal song, I think it's really nothing special, but they re-recorded it in 2001 for the Mandrake bonus edition and it's a pretty significant improvement in my opinion. Heart of Twilight shows some of their early um, hard rock influences, but it's a pretty weak track. Dead Maker has a progier riff. I do like the riff in the chorus. I think it's really interesting, but the melody is not. Angel Rebellion reminds me a little bit of Paradise. It also has a very cool opening guitar lick. Uh, it's a pretty okay track. Back into hell, Angel Rebellion. Back into hell, Angel Rebellion. When a Hero Cries is a ballad, very simplistic. Uh, we have just a piano and keyboards and this is something that they would kind of keep doing for the next couple of records as with tomorrow on the following record or another time from theater of salvation or sense of time from savage poetry but to be honest this is a very very basic ballad and it doesn't really do anything with me steel church quite honestly i don't even remember that track anymore and there's also the kingdom over 18 minutes long epic and i do have to say there are some hints of epicness and of Edguy's greatness but especially in that chorus those uh, vocals are a bit like wolves howling it's kind of funny also we've got this moment with like very strange piano arrangement wise You know, it's a long track, but I don't really think it's that memorable. The album does have a specific atmosphere, I'll give it that, and a very specific sound, which is appealing to a certain degree, but it doesn't really have much else going on. Um, it's pretty forgettable. Also, I read in their biography that um, there was some review or reviews, I don't remember exactly, that were not very flattering at the time, and basically uh, not many people considered Ed Guy to be... Uh, band with the future that there wasn't really anything big waiting for them and that they were not really a band that would achieve anything if i had only this album to kind of judge this on 
I would probably have the same opinion. Number nine, maybe quite surprisingly, their follow-up Vainglory Opera from 1998. This is already a very, very, very good album. A lot of people like to say that one of the biggest growths that any band had come through was Metallica between Kill Them All and Ride the Lightning. I think that how much Ed Guy progressed since their debut album on this album is unbelievable. I don't really know about more drastic transition in a good way. I mean, the production, the sound, the songwriting, the vocals, the performances, everything is so much better in just a year. Of course, what really helped this album was Timo Tolki, the guitar player from Stradivarius, who at that point, of course, Stradivarius were very popular. And there's a story, I encourage you to check out Timo Tolki's interview from like a year or two ago, where he basically talks about anything, you know, like he talks about Halloween, Stradivarius, Ed Guy, Toby. And at that time, he had a day basically scheduled only for interviews. And the last interviewer he had in that day was Toby, who came in and said, I'm not an interviewer, I have here, I think it was Kingdom of Madness, this album, you're gonna listen to it. And uh, Timo said that he really liked the songs, but the production was horrible. Vainglory Opera sounds amazing. Also, Hansi Kürsch, their uh, fellow German colleague from Blind Guardian, helped them a lot with the vocals. So that's probably where Toby really learned how to uh, arrange chords and big vocals and whatnot. And Hansi's voice in certain sections really give this album a very specific sound. It has a cool intro overture. This is actually one of the two albums that have an opening like this, like an intro. Until We Rise Again is a really, really great track. One of the best, in my opinion, from Ed Guy. And especially how the first chorus kicks. <laughs> Out of Control is a big anthem, and I think that Hansi Kursch really helps the song. The title track, Vainglory Opera, and quite possibly the most overplayed track from this album, even live, is, well, one of the most iconic songs in the genre. Walk On Fighting is slightly more of a hard rock song. We also have two beautiful ballads that kind of mirror what they did on Savage Poetry. We've got Tomorrow, which is based on keyboards. And then we have Scarlet Rose, which starts acoustically, but then essentially really kicks into a big power metal ballad. One of my favorite tracks on the album was always No More Fooling, which is almost like a thrash metal track that I could imagine Antrax or Slayer to play. Really heavy track, I really love it, and I kind of wish they went for songs like this a bit more, especially that part after the second chorus. How Many Miles and Fairy Tale are both very solid track. There's also an Ultravox cover, Hymn, it's a cool track, it's a great cover, I don't really think it was necessary for this album, I think the album would just do well without it. I'm not a big fan of covers. Now we're going to move quite a bit, and at number 8 I have Age of the Joker from 2011. This is definitely the most experimental album from Ed Guy, this is their ninth studio album, ninth studio album, and it's actually their only 
album which Toby wrote, one of the two albums that Toby wrote completely alone. Now, I mean, it's a bit of a strange thing to say because he is the lead songwriter and he did write like 95% of the music, but this album along with its predecessor are two records where there were no contributions by the other band members. And by that, I mean the guitar player. It seems like many fans consider this to be the weakest album from Ed Guy. Even I wasn't too happy with it when it came out and I was like considering it to be among their weakest records. But the album has grown on me and I think that it's one of those records that you really need to give it a chance. And once again, it's a very experimental album. The most experimental from Toby, including Amantasia as well. Nobody's Hero is a great track. I really love that riff a la Primal Fear and the chorus is just awesome. Then Rock of Cashel and Pandora's Box. These two tracks are, in my opinion, two of the most experimental songs from Edguy. Uh, Rock of Cashel, basically it's like hard rock meets folk. We also get like this medieval midsection. It's a, it's a fantastic track with a lot of great moments. Pandora's Box, for some reason, always reminded me of Aerosmith. It's a, it's a great hard rock song. Also, that bluesy midsection is just great. Then Breathe is a cool, modern-sounding, synth-driven track with the perfect chorus. And similar in that regard is 2 out of 7, which is actually one of the two songs they shot a music video for. And it has never really been officially released, even though you can check it out on YouTube. The Arcane Guild is a classical anthemic Ed Guy, kind of for the older fans because it resembles the early stuff from Ed Guy. It's a cool song nonetheless. Then we've got Fire on the Downline, which is a lot of cool moments, and especially the 80s sounding chorus is just really great. Then Every Night Without You is a solid, albeit a bit traditional rock ballad. One of the best tracks on the album actually I think is God Fallen Silent, the only song co-written by Jens Ludwig, but this is a bonus track. You can't really find it on regular editions of the album, but I think it should have made the cut because it's actually better than some of the other songs. But there are also some songs I'm not necessarily a big fan of, like uh, the main single Robin Hood, almost eight and a half minutes long song that they shot a music video for, which was obviously a uh, edited version and kind of a funny music video. But I think that this song has one of the most average choruses from Ed Guy and generally it's just a very anti-single track. Like I would never release this track as a single, not to mention that um, midsection that kind of rips Seven Sound of a Seven Sound, which Toby even kind of makes fun of life. Then, for example, Faces in the Darkness. I really like the first two and a half minutes of the track. It's very dark, very serious. But then that very cheesy and very forced sounding chorus just doesn't really work for me. I really hate that, as, both as a listener and as a composer, when you go for a certain mood, certain vibe, and then you completely destroy it. And he had done something similar a year before this record on The Wicked Symphony from Avantasia. You have a track Blizzard on Broken Mirrors with Andre Matos. And he's also, it kind of starts very darkly, very heavily, but then, you know, it kind of shifts back into that traditional anthemic part, which I, it just doesn't really work for me. I don't really like that type of a change in a song. And Behind the Gates to Midnight World is almost nine minute long song here on this record, so the longest one. And again, 
It has an amazing riff, especially how the whole band kicks off. Then it doesn't really do anything with that riff, the song is totally unrelated to it and in my opinion it's just such a waste of a great riff. And also one thing I like here is that section in the second half, which is kind of cliche but still very epic. If you are one of those fans who consider it to be a weaker album, just give it a chance and it's it's gonna grow on you, believe me. At number 7 I have Ed Guy's fifth studio album, Mandrake from 2001. This was kind of a big record for Ed Guy because they had their first music video for All the Clowns, their first single, Painting on the Wall, and they also had their first tour where they toured as a main act. And I also read from Toby's stories that basically this was the first tour where they earned some money, where they started actually earning money. This album is generally considered to be one of the best albums in the power metal genre. I can see why the opening track, the kind of a title track, Tears of Mandrake, is the obvious hit and one of their most overplayed tracks, but yeah, it's a it's an epic track. Then Golden Dawn kind of combines hard rock with power metal. Jerusalem is a bit like a Rock of Cashel, the track from Age of the Joker that I was talking about. It also has these like folk vibes. It's an awesome track and also we've got that uh, midsection, which is very folky. <laughs> All the Clowns is like this traditional power metal anthem, but a good one. Probably my favorite track on the album would be actually Nailed to the Wheel. It starts acoustically, but when it hits off, when it kind of starts going, it's arguably one of the heaviest tracks from Ed Guy, and I just love it. I don't think they ever played it live, which is kind of a shame, and I personally wouldn't mind if they had three, four songs like this per record, because I, it's just so heavy and so good. I really love this track. Then we've got over 10 minutes long epic Pharaoh that has some oriental vibes, and actually when I saw them live, in 2009, when they were supporting Tinnitus Sanctus, they played this track, so how cool is that? Wash Away the Poison is the ballad on the album, but I do have to say this is one of the more average ballads from them. Fallen Angels is super catchy and epic and this is a track that could have been on Theater of Salvation. Yes, Painting on the Wall, their first single, is essentially a hard rock song and a very good one. Save Us Now is really punchy and epic, very melodic track. Also, The Devil and the Savannah is like a hard rock track. Funny thing though, before making this video, I always thought it was The Devil and the Servant. And then I was like, oh, it's not really Servant, it's Savant or whatever it is. But number six, I have Hellfire Club from 2004. This was probably their breakthrough album. They had two music videos from this record and this is kind of when they really became a known band in a way. Also, this record can be seen as a record where they kind of started shifting away from that power metal. And very interesting thing about Ed Guy is that 
They started like a power metal, speed metal band, but they essentially transformed into more of a hard rock band. And I don't really know about anyone else like this. So Mysteria is a very iconic opener. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Freak Show. It's just a really great opener. It's such a heavy and dark track, and I really love it when they get heavy. Heels are crawling everywhere, compounding with the king. The Piper Never Dies is a 10 minutes long hard rock opus. We Don't Need a Hero is one of the few moments where I would say they had that power metal thing going on for themselves. I really like the bridge, and both times we hear the bridge, the melody is a bit different. So I think that is a really nice touch. Rise of the Morning Glory is actually quite similar in terms of the style to this track. Then we got Down to the Devil, it has a great theme, it's essentially a hard rock song. King of Fools is one of the singles. This is quite honestly one of the most overplayed tracks for me and I don't really like the song anymore, but it's probably because it's probably probably it's probably because seriously, it's probably because I have just heard it way too many times. I do prefer verses a little bit uh, more. Forever is like a classical hard rock ballad. Under the Moon is an amazing stadium rocker. And very similar in that regard is Navigator, which could have been an Iron Maiden track. Laboratory Love Machine is probably the best example of Ed Guy's hard rock. And I also want to talk about the final track, The Spirit Will Remain, which is a ballad where you basically hear an orchestra. It's a very operatic piece. And I think Toby had this almost like an uncanny ability to really move you with his voice when he was singing some kind of a ballad. Like just listen to the track In My Defense, which is essentially a Freddie Mercury song. And he made a cover on Avantasia. And quite honestly, I think it's better than Freddie's version. And The Spirit Will Remain is, in my opinion, one of the most emotional songs I've ever heard. And there's a little bit of a story with this track. My cousin, who died in 2008, he was around 30 years old at that point, he was a huge fan of like death metal and black metal and basically the music I don't really listen to. But when he died, his wife came to me and she said, I would really like for you to pick a ballad to be played at his funeral. And The Spirit Will Remain became the song. And whenever I listen to it, I, I remember him. And it's, it's just a very, very strong song. Before I go on, Ed Guy also released King of Fools EP before this album. There are a couple of the tracks that didn't make it to this record, and they're all, in my opinion, worth checking out. Especially check out the track Holy Water, which is just one of their best songs. I kind of understand why they didn't put those songs on this record, because they're more in the style of what they had done before, but still, the tracks are definitely worth checking out. 
Okay, at number five, I have Tinnitus Sanctus from 2008. In many ways, this album was similar to Mandrake in that earlier in that year, Toby released an Avantasia. In 2001, he dropped the first Avantasia Metal Opera Part 1. Then Mandrake came out later in that year. And in 2008, at the beginning, he released The Scarecrew. He basically came back to Avantasia after six years and he released one of his best works, The Scarecrew. And I remember when The Scarecrew came out, I was still at high school. I was, list I was playing the crap out of that record. And when it was like September or October, I was already at university for the first year. I checked the Ed guy. Ed Guy's webpage. I was like, what are the guys up to? Just let's check them out. And it was like new album coming out. So what? We've just got a record from Toby. What's going on? He was very, very prolific in that period. And that's why this album became a very strong soundtrack to my first year at university. When this album was released, uh, Toby basically promoted it as the best Ed Guy's album and the album, all of the future Ed Guy records were going to be measured against. And I also read another interview many years later where he still considered this to be the best Ed Guy album. Um, it's really great. I like how modern, dark sounding it is. Uh, probably that's why not many fans were gravitating towards it nearly as much, because it's, it's really much darker and much more heavy than all of the stuff that came before. The opening track, Ministry of Saints, in my opinion, really perfectly reflects what was going on in 2008. There were so many 80s hard rock bands that were coming back and that were releasing new music after many, many years. And most of their music was that 80s hard rock with the modern twist, like detuned guitars, heavy riffs. Ministry of Saints is a great example of that. Sex, Fire, Religion is very similar and the chorus is absolutely huge. The pride of creation is more in that old power metal style and I used to not be a big fan of this track, also Speedhoven which I'm going to mention later. These two tracks were much more like a speed power metal songs and I didn't like them. I was like, they break the mood for me and I wish they were as heavy and dark as the rest of the album. But now, maybe because I matured, maybe because I have written a lot of music in my life, I can see that these songs are great because they add some variety to the record and you need it because if the whole album was dark and heavy, it would have been more cohesive, but it would be also more boring, in my opinion. So, yeah, it's a cool track. I especially love that midsection, which is just unbelievably good. Uh, it gets me every time I hear it. Nine Lives is so dark and serious, even Toby singing. Another anthemic tune with a great chorus is Wake Up Dreaming Black, but we gotta talk about Dragonfly, one of the best choruses Toby has ever written. I really love how the chorus doesn't arrive the first time you actually expect it, you have to really wait for it, but that chorus is just so huge. And it's a bit of a shame they don't really play this track live, but on the other hand I understand that this track just would never really sound this huge with just Toby singing. You need the choir. You wanna fly? Thorn Without a Rose is this power ballad or pop rock song. Nine to Nine is a great song. I think that they should have uh, made a video for it. And I also love how playful the lyrics are. The 
The longest track on the album is almost eight minutes long, Speed Hoven, which is like this power metal, speed metal track. Um, it's a solid track, I just like all of the other tracks a lot more. And the same goes for Dead or Rock, which is a hard rock song, very similar to a lot of the stuff we could have found on Rocket Ride. But I think that Dead or Rock is, again, pretty average as a tune. We also have Aren't You a Little Pervert 2, a sort of a um, bluesy polka funny song, and that guy always try to do something funny per every record. Americans prefer the rodeo. Okay, number four, I have Space Police, Defenders of the Faith. I actually purchased this album just a couple of weeks ago. This is a digibook edition now 20% more metal, <laughs> I love it. Uh, this is their latest studio album from 2014, and it seems that with this record they kind of went back to their roots, and this is much more of a power metal album than the four album albums preceding it. I remember when this album came out, the first track they actually released in form of a single was Saber and Torch, and quite honestly, I think that this is a pretty weak track. It's a very cliche predictable power metal song and I got so scared I was like oh no Ed guy have gotten average but fortunately the rest of the album is just so unbelievably good. Space Police is a brilliant heavy metal track with a brilliant brilliant chorus. Defenders of the Crown is more power metal. Again, it's an awesome track and I love that not so obvious chorus. Love Tiger, the song that they made an animated music video for, reminds me a little bit of The Darkness. I think that this could have been their track. It's a very feel-good hard rock song, kind of in the style of Laboratory Love Machine. The Realms of Baba Yaga is another amazing banger, and I just have to say, uh, these choruses, some of the best from Toby, like the writing on this album is unbelievably good. Then we've got Rock Me Amadeus, a cover from Falcon, or Falcon, whatever it's called. Uh, it's a great song, it's a great cover, and I encourage you to read the stories from the Digibook, why they included it there, they just wanted to have a cover that a heavy metal band wouldn't do. At Guy, we're always about defying expectations. But, uh, you know, I've already mentioned I'm not a big fan of covers. It's a great song, it's very well made, I just don't really see how this record benefits from it. I think the record would have been just fine without it. Do Me Like, Do Me like a Caveman is a bit more serious, but the chorus is much brighter. In this case, it doesn't bother me though. It's just so well written. Another epic tune is Shadow Eaters, then we've got Alone in Myself, which is essentially like an AOR song. The Eternal Wayfarer is this almost nine minute long epic of the album. I would like for the chorus to be a bit more serious and a bit more in tone with the rest of the track, but you know, the operatic part before the final chorus is really amazing. Um, it's a great, great tune. B 
before I reveal my top three picks, just wanted to tell you that these videos are extremely time consuming and because of the audio samples and the copyright claims, I won't be able to earn any money from them like ever. So that's why if you want to support me, the best and the only way how you can do it is by buying my debut album, Persids in Life. The second album is on the way. If you like Toby, if you like his great writing and his great melodies, you're gonna love my records, I can guarantee that. Just check out the track, we're building our monument. Okay, let's go to number three. At number three I have Theater of Salvation from 1999. This is their third studio album, and I would say once again, uh, they've improved a lot since Vainglory Opera. I wouldn't say that this album necessarily sound that, that much better, but the songwriting is just absolutely unbelievably good. I would say this is one of the best, if not the best, power metal album of all time. It's got an epic intro, The Healing Vision, and then we've got the track Babylon, which is probably the most overplayed track from the album. And it's a cool song, but quite honestly, I think everything else on the album is just so much better. With the Babylon, I actually prefer the bridge. I think it's pretty cool with the rhythm change. Then Land of the Miracle is this great epic power ballad. I really love how piano leads the whole track. Wake Up the King is like this idea of opera metal, something that Toby explored fully on Avantasia. The Unbeliever is a similar tune, a bit more punchy. The Headless Game is another great song, but I do have to say, if you listen to The Headless Game and then listen to Lost in Space from Avantasia, the beginnings of both choruses are basically the same, aren't they? Falling Down is another power metal anthem. I really love Arrows Fly, that arpeggio at the beginning as a riff, and the chorus is just very, very well written track, and in my opinion, even now, it sounds so original and so fresh. I mean. Why don't more power metal bands go for something like this? Holy Shadows is one of those hard rock songs from the early era. Another Time is a ballad in the style of like Sense of Time or Tomorrow, we basically have just piano and keyboards. I can take it for granted, I know that our life is in line. For another day in your life, another time. We gotta talk about the title track Theater of Salvation, which is probably the best epic from Toby. This song is perfect from start to finish. There's this little section where his voice cracks and they left it there, it sounds amazing. Okay, there are two albums left and probably these are not the records most Edguy fans would put at the top, so at number two I have the Savage Poetry from 2000. Depends on how you look at it, this can be considered to be their debut album or their fourth studio album. They actually recorded Savage Poetry in 1995 after two demos, this was their first album, but it was mostly a demo because it was recorded not in a professional studio. And five years later, the, you know, on their tours there were a lot of fans who were paying a lot of money to get the original Savage Poetry from 1995 because, because it was self-released, uh, they only had like thousand copies and people were paying a lot of money to get it. So they decided to re-release this album, but not only re-release the material, but to rework it as well. And it's absolutely unbelievable what they were able to do with the original material, which, don't take me wrong, it had some cool moments, some cool riffs, but I wouldn't really consider the material to be 
worthy of revisiting. But the way they re-recorded the whole material, uh, it basically resulted in one of the most original metal albums of all time, in my opinion. This album is fantastic. I absolutely love it. Also, I do have to say that this is probably the album where Toby went for his highest notes of his career. Uh, and also, for the sake of this album, I will always include a sample from the original 95 release and then how they reworked it. And you can see, you will be able to see that the differences are enormous. So, Hello Be Thy Name is a great power metal song with a really great chorus. Misguiding Your Life is just a badass song. Another power metal jam is key to my fate. The piano is really interesting here. Sense of Time is a piano-based ballad uh, with some strings. This is one of the two songs that didn't go through that much of a change, but I like how on the original recording he even has like a mistake on the piano where he messed up and they left it there. Of course, this was recording on tape, so it makes sense. Running to break the line. Do you feel the sense of time? Sacred Hell is a heavier tune, and especially that proggy riff after the second chorus is just so good. Sacred Hell, Sacred Hell, so the fiend must be back on a ball. Lose all your sins, lose all your sorrow. Here we go. Then we've got the epic of the album, 10 minutes long, Eyes of the Tyrant, which has a lot of sections. The main chorus of the track is one of the Toby's best choruses. It's freaking amazing. I saw the tyrant. Frozen Candle is pretty uncompromising and here you can see probably the biggest change where much of the chorus in the original version didn't have any vocals and we have this really cool like an acoustic hard rock kind of uh, break in the middle which was there in the original recording but it was not really that good. Um, I'll tell you what I am. Frozen candle. I gotta tell you 
Roses to No One is a power ballad like Scarlet Rose. This is one of the two songs that didn't really change that much. And I my roses to no one. There is no mind to help me to see. And then Power and Majesty ends the song just like the title suggests. Okay, so you probably know which album is number one, so Rocket Ride from 2006. This is, in my opinion, the best album from Toby, his best material, his best vocal performance. His voice is just so different after this album. Just This is not only his best vocal performance, one of the best vocal performances ever, and also this is one of the best sounding albums. Sasha Peth made an incredible job with this album. The amount of detail, the sounds, there is always something to discover here. This album is one of my all-time favorite records. If you listen to my first album, Persis in Life 1, and you check the first track, We're Building Our Own Monument, that song kind of reflects this record, and I think if it was recorded with guitars, it could have been on a record like this. So Sacrifice is probably his most epic song. Theater of Salvation is kind of the other competitor. Um, the dynamics, the peaks, it rises, it falls, how it builds up to that um, sort of a climax of the track, which gets me every time I, I hear it. This song is perfect. It's absolutely perfect. Rocket Ride is a fantastic track, but I do have to say a little, probably the only criticism I'm going to have towards this album. My favorite chorus, we hear the chorus three times. My favorite chorus is the second one. Basically in all of them we've got double bass and this kind of speed metal drums, but the second chorus has a half time. And it's so powerful, so punchy. As a songwriter I would probably make the last chorus similar, or I would put that chorus as the last one, because it's just... Such a great moment. Wasted Time's gotta be one of the best songs ever written. And I know some people like to say that he sort of a took the main theme from the song Anya from Deep Purple. And if you compare them, it's essentially the same, but Deep Purple had a great idea and they didn't do anything with it because the track is pretty average. Toby transformed it into one of the best songs of all time. Now that's the real talent. A great modern rock tune is Matrix with some keys in the background and some really solid grooves. Return to the Tribe is more in that power metal style, it's a very celebratory track and it also has a very strange vocal solo. It's strange, but also kind of cool. The Asylum is another epic. It starts acoustically, but when it kicks off, man, it kicks hard. Save Me could have and should have been another single from the album. This is a very American pop rock ballad. Fantastic track. I think it 
could have easily been a radio hit. Catch of the Century is an amazing 80s hard rock tune. Out of Vogue is a faster tune. That key driven main theme is fantastic. Superheroes is everything a hit needs to be. We never cry for love. Also, on the Superheroes EP, there's a slow version, which is equally great. And this reminds me of It's My Life from Bon Jovi, one of the biggest rock songs. And, you know, also the slow version became a huge hit. I think the same thing should have happened with Superheroes. Trinidad has very strong summer vibes. It's almost combining, uh, like, reggae with rock. And also fucking with fire hair for once is just hard rock at its best. I also have to mention the Superheroes EP, which has just amazing songs like Blessing in this guy's the Michael Kiske duet Judas at the Opera, but especially Spooks in the Attic. These tracks are equally good and I personally consider them to be a part of the Rocket Ride package. This was the time when Toby was most prolific, like even if you look at the Scarecrow album, uh, it was preceded by two EPs, Lost in Space 1 and Lost in Space 2, and on one of them there's a track, The Story Ain't Over, which is not just the best Avantasia track, but in my opinion one of the best tracks from Toby, and it was just on an EP, it wasn't on the album, but he, I think that they always keep playing it live, so he was just very, very prolific, and he wasn't keeping the songs, he was just, okay, let's release it all, and uh, as, as a songwriter, I would probably keep those songs, because you never know when you might run out of ideas, but these two things, they do go together. So there you have it, I have a huge headache today, so it was kind of a challenging to go through this, but anyway, uh, let me know, please let me know in the comment section below whether you agreed or disagreed with me and most importantly let me know what is your own worst to best of that guy's discography. Let's have some fun and please let's respect each other's opinions. You can follow me on Facebook or on Instagram, you can find links to both in the description of this video below. Also if you like this review don't forget to like, to share, to subscribe. You can check out my own original music, my live performances, my other videos within Worst to Best series and quite a lot of other reviews and series as well. So, thanks a lot for watching.